So, um, uh, so maybe a more, uh, I mean, so some of the, the vague topic of, of this talk is uh, symmetry operators and, and energies. Um, and uh, I mean, there will be, there's some overlap between this talk and Peter's talk, which I think was yesterday, and, and Thomas's talk, which will be on uh, Friday. And, uh, um, and some, <coughs> so this is more, uh, quite, quite, uh, quite a bit more vague and maybe, but uh, I think it's uh, maybe somehow trying to say what, what the philosophy is, so to speak. So I mean, uh, so I'm going to look at at, um, at Lorentzian space times, and, and so since we're using uh, spinner methods, this is the natural signature, and much of what I say actually works uh, quite generally. But uh, but for simplicity, uh, you can think about the vacuum case, um, and and so a very important feature in this in this setting is that uh, the, the Lorentz group, as, as, as is well known, uh, is double covered by SL2C. And so um, this, this, uh, this is also related to the correspondence between uh, spinners and tensors. So we have this, which I also uh, wrote in, in, in the course Uh, sorry. So, so there is this correspondence between vectors and and uh, complex matrices, and uh, so in, in this is uh, then you can then denote this by x a a prime, where these indices uh, refer to elements in the fundamental representations of SL2C, uh, which is C2 and, and C2 bar. So those are the spinner spaces uh, in, in this four-dimensional Lorentzian setting. Uh, and uh, this correspondence between vectors and spinners can be generalizes to a correspondence between uh, uh, spinners and, and tensors. Which, uh, which plays a very important role. Uh, and uh, so it, in, in this space, it's natural to introduce uh, a, a spin dyad, um, which is simply a, a basis of that complex two-dimensional space. And here is the, the corresponding basis is denoted with primed indices. And, and properly, there should be a, a complex conjugate on those. Uh, so this, uh, having this dyad allows us to expand things out in, um, in, uh, uh, in terms of components, of scalar components, if, which is sometimes convenient, but uh, in, in principle should be avoided. Um, uh, and uh, there's... <coughs> Uh, there's an uh, important uh, fact that somehow that this setting is, is very well adapted to looking at null vectors because uh, tensor products of, of such uh, one spinners uh, are null vectors. So there is a null tetrad. Which is which is coming out naturally. So and the, and then there is an M bar. Uh, so so this is a, uh, this consists of two real null vectors, which are those, and and two complex ones, which are essentially uh, you can think of as as aligned 
in the in in a spherical direction, uh, and so that that all comes out very naturally. Uh, and so if we look at spin tensors. Uh, Um, so we, we can look at some some uh, general uh, spin spin tensor like that, which is just uh, tensor products of one spinners lying in either of those spaces. Uh, uh, the 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 irreducible representations of SL2C are are easily described. Uh, and those are those come in this this so there's this family uh, uh, which is simply uh, uh, spinners of this form And, and uh, we have symm it's symmetric in 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 these collections of indices. So those are simply the the, the irreducible representations, and um, and uh, so okay. So so now once we have this setup, we have uh, the the lift. We have the double cover of of this, which is the ortho orthogonal frame group of this uh, Lorentzian space, we can uh, use the fact that any, complex, any globally hyperbolic space time is spin. So we can lift this to, uh, we can lift the whole orthogonal frame bundle um, to a double cover and use uh, these uh, these representation spaces to build vector bundles over the the space time so this lifts to m and and in, in the in the mo in the general setting that that we're interested in uh, and uh, another important fact is that there's an sl2c uh, invariant uh, area element epsilon a b, which is skew, uh, and uh, that can be related. So this is like a spin metric, so um, so now we have the, the complete setting. Um, on the on the on the spinner side, so to speak, and and now <coughs> this uh, spin spinner tensor correspondence, together with the uh, this simple description of irreducible representations, uh, we can now, for example, um, so I, sh I should say one more thing, so that um, now once we lift this construction to M, uh, we also have a lift of the Levitivita. Uh, um, uh, covariant derivative, which gives uh, an operation on spinners like that. Okay, and uh, so now we can split we can split tensors and spinners into uh, into these ir irreducible representations, okay? Uh, <clears throat> and uh, this is, uh, for example, if we take the Riemann tensor, this splits into a scalar part, a trace-free uh, Ricci part, and a four-spinner, which is the, the vial. And uh, so, so these are going to be equal to zero in vacuum if uh, R A B is equal to zero. So, so if we're in vacuum, we can focus on this spinner, and we we have the correspondence 
uh, something like that. <coughs> uh, so there's a correspondence between the vial tensor and the vial spinner. <coughs> if we have a complex uh, skew two form, uh, which is anti-self-dual, then uh, this has the form uh, like that. So, so, and and this is now a symmetric spinner. <clears throat> and so uh, the vial tensor and uh, skew symmetric forms uh, are particular examples of irreducible representations of SL2C and therefore also of irreducible representations of, of, of SO31. So these are some of the important types of tensors that we should focus on. Uh, and, and so... Uh, so we have this, this procedure for splitting uh, spinners. And now if I apply a covariant derivative to a spinner, this is, if, I, if this is symmetric, so it's coming from one of those irreducible representations, this is no longer in general symmetric. So we can split, uh, we can take this, uh, this nabla uh, and split it into fundamental operators. And uh, those are divergence, curl, curl dagger, and twist. So uh, if I take this expression, that I, I take a general spinner, apply a covariant derivative, and decompose the result into uh, irreducible representations. That gives me four fundamental operators. And these are, are related to what's known in geometry as, uh, or in, which are known as Stein-Weiss operators in, in other circumstances. And so uh, let me, so D here is just a divergence. Uh, curl dagger has the following form. Uh, this has, uh, um, let me see here, yeah. Um, so if I, if I apply this to a, to a spinner with, uh, with no primed indices, for example, then I end up with um, uh, expressions of the following form. So that's an example of, of curl dagger applied to a two, in, two index uh, spinner. And this is the Maxwell equation. Um, if I apply it to a four index spinner, uh, uh, well, so, 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 okay, so, sorry. So this is the operator and Maxwell then can be written as curl dagger phi equal to zero. And this is the Bianchi operator. That can be written as curl dagger psi equal to zero, for example. Uh, another, uh, an interesting fact is if we apply uh, curl dagger to a vector field, so if I have a vector field, let's say uh, W uh, A A prime, uh, then if I apply curl dagger to W, and if that's equal to zero, then it follows that, that uh, the following uh, one form um, this, this is conserved. So this means that if if this uh, if this vector satisfies the this equation, which can also be called the adjoint uh, Maxwell equation, 
then the, f the current that I defined by contracting one index here using the epsilon with the Maxwell field is conserved. So that's a general fact. So, so to construct uh, conserved currents, all you need to do is to find solutions to this equation. Right, exactly. And um, yes, exactly. So, so this means that uh, when I apply the covariant derivative here, I produce uh, two primed indices, and those get symmetrized. And the unprimed index, this has one unprimed index which, which goes away. So the result is, uh, um, uh, has, has purely uh, primed indices. OK. Uh, and so th this is just a calculation that, uh, that to see that this, this fact holds. Uh, uh, so, so that's, that's um, curl dagger. So curl is just the complex conjugate of, of curl dagger. And uh, the remaining operator on this list uh, is the twist. Uh, and if we look at this equation, twist on something equal to zero, if uh, uh, so, so here I should I should call so k and l. This is the valence. So uh, simply the number of primed, unprimed, and primed indices. This is the valence. And if I have uh, this is the twist operator. And um, if, if we look at, at the case of valence 1, 1, uh, uh, a solution to that equation, this is just a con conformal killing vector field. Uh, so a 1, 1 spinner, remember, is, is, is the same as a vector. And uh, if you apply the, the twist, what, you, what, you're, what, you, what you're going to do is uh, you, you take the primed index, the unprimed index, and uh, if kappa has a primed and an un, uh, unprimed index, you, you apply the derivative symmetrize over everything and set that equal to zero. So now we have, this is the twist equation for kappa. And this is simply uh, the conformal killing vector field equation. If we have a valence two, Uh, a valence two zero spinner, uh, then uh, the equation looks like this. And this is the conformal killing spinner equation. Okay. And uh, so we have, on the one hand, we have the spin S equations. Uh, on the other hand, we have this twist equation. And this is this twist equation uh, is, is quite important. Uh, and uh, this, this uh, seems to organize a, a lot of things. Uh, and uh, let's see here. Um, so if we look at, yeah, so now, Yeah, so I should say, uh, so from, from uh, having, uh, so the divergence is, of course, uh, underdetermined. Uh, curl is essentially, that, that's a, that gives a hyperbolic system in this case. So this is determined. And the twist e equation is overdetermined. So that gives uh, curvature constraints. And so uh, if twist kappa equal to zero, in this valence two case, this means that the psi a b c this has to be equal to zero, and uh, now we can. This is a kappa is a two spinner, so it has only two possible algebraic types, and uh, the one type is that kappa a v is proportional up to some choice of 
of spinner diode of that of to a spinner of that form. And so that means that that psi uh, is proportional to something like that. So this means that we're in Petrov type N or O. So uh, so there's there there's a four times repeated principle uh, spinner. And the other possibility that we can have is that uh, it's proportional to something like this. So this is the degenerate case in some sense. This is the uh, generic case. And in that case, the, the curvature spinner has to be proportional to uh, a symmetrized product like that. And this is the Petrov D or O case. So this means that, um, and, and, so, and, and so there's, there's a particularly uh, useful form. So we can write this as zeta like that. And, and then this zeta is proportional to psi 2 to the minus 1 third. And uh, so I should have said somewhere that if we have, if we have a, a spinner phi AB, uh, then that projects on scalars phi 0, which is phi AB, OA, OB, and up to phi 2, which is phi AB, OIA, I, uh, B. Okay, and similarly for psi A, B, C, D projects on scalars psi I, I going from zero to four. Okay, so this is, this is the middle uh, curvature scalar. Uh, and this, uh, there's this proportionality between the negative third, negative cube root, one over negative cube root of the middle curvature scalar and the conform the scale factor in this uh, killing spinner. So it's a general fact that, that if, you, if you're in, uh, uh, so, so the correspondence is like this. So if, you're in, if you have a space time which has a two, type 2, 0 killing spinner, this implies D, N, or O. On the other hand, if you're in type D vacuum, then, you're, then you actually have a killing spinner of that type. And you all, what you also have is, is you have two killing vector fields. Okay? So this is, this is uh, important uh, correspondence. And this is, of course, has been known for a long time. Uh, but, uh, but maybe not appreciated uh, as it should. Okay. Uh, so, um, and so, so, now, so now we're restricting uh, the, the space times more and more by imposing this, uh, that we have a solution of the twister equation. And if we uh, look at, so these killing fields, one of, the, one of these killing fields can be got like this. So if we're in vacuum and we have a, a, a solution of the killing spinner equation, this is a killing vector field. And if we suppose that this is proportional to a real killing vector field, then, uh, then we're in the, in the Kernot class. So if we look at vacuum, if we're here, this is uh, essentially Kerr not C. So there's the Kerr family, which has two parameters. There's another parameter uh, called the not charge, and then there's, there's an acceleration parameter. And so all of those space times are classified. Uh, this condition restricts uh, and, and throws out this 
this part. And uh, in this case, what you have is a, is a symmetric two tensor, which is a killing tensor. And, uh, and so this, this leads to Carter's constant. So, so this, uh, this expression here is conserved along uh, geodesics. And furthermore, this uh, operator commutes with the wave uh, operator. So uh, once, you're, once you have made these restrictions, that's what you have. Uh, OK. Uh, and so uh, an important um, fact um, about this that we have in this situation, which I think is, is somehow not, not sufficiently appreciated, is that uh, we can talk about killing spinner initial data. Uh, and so if we define This is simply, so now this kappa is not necessarily a killing spinner. Uh, and if we define SAB to be the symmetrized covariant derivative of psi, where psi is, is now defined uh, as this derivative, okay? <clears throat> then, uh, then if if we have a sigma is uh, and h i j k i j, this is a, a, a Cauchy data set, and suppose that that uh, h its normal derivative of the surface s and its normal derivative of the surface at sigma is equal to zero. This, this condition is, this is, means that essentially we have trivial Cauchy data for the, the, uh, the corresponding wave equation that you derive by applying an adjoint to the twist. So you take sort of twist star twist gives you a wave equation. You have trivial uh, initial data for that. Uh, and what you find is that this condition here is equivalent to having uh, a, a valence 2, 0 killing spinner in the domain of dependence on sigma. Yeah? OK. Uh, and um, so this, this means that uh, this the type D condition is somehow is related to uh, the killing spinner condition, but it's, it's, uh, it's, in fact, it's the killing spinner condition, which is slightly more general than, than the Petrov classification, that propagates causally. Okay? And, and this, uh, this condition here, uh, this, this can be characterized Uh, intrinsically on sigma, okay? And so these, this, this result, this, uh, um, this is uh, uh, due to uh, Thomas and Juan uh, Antonio Valente Crone and, and I guess Al Alfonso uh, Garcia Parada in, in uh, uh, several papers. Um, and uh, an interesting fact, or at least I think it's a fact, uh, is that, um, which you can sort of understand from, from those papers, but uh, is that if you have a, uh, so if you have, 
such killing spinner initial data. And uh, if uh, it's asymptotically flat and contains an apparent horizon, I, that, that means to say a MOTS, uh, then it's Kerr. So that means that this this uh, hyper this Cauchy data is actually isometric to a hypersurface a Cauchy hypersurface in Kerr, and so so uh, this is this is somehow never has never really been properly written down, but I I, I believe it is true, or at least I I, I make that conjecture, uh, and so the the picture is like this that you have so here is scry here is space like infinity. Here is the horizon, and and you have a Cauchy, de, Cauchy surface that contains a, a, a marginally outer trapped surface, and that's sitting on a on an uh, on an apparent horizon that's approaching the event horizon. So so such a surface, morally speaking, uh, looks like that. And and of course uh, there are Cauchy surfaces which don't contain uh, a, a, a MOTS modern outer trap surface. Uh, but if it does, then this forces uh, the mass to be positive, and then, uh, and then you, can, you can exclude uh, the, the, the C, and then you can use other uh, facts to exclude the nut case. So, so then you're down to curve. So this, is a, uh, this allows you to characterize and recognize uh, the Kerr space-time, <clears throat> and and so this this is uh, this is sort of an illustration of uh, these uh, these concepts. Um, okay, um, so but so what I, I really wanted to talk about is um, how this how these ideas relate to uh, energy estimates and. Uh, Because now, once, once we can recognize Kerr uh, in this way, uh, Kerr, of course, has a, has a very nice, uh, has many nice coordinate representations. It, it has, uh, there is a two-parameter family uh, parameterized uh, by, by A and M. And for A less than M, it's a black hole. Um, and so we'd like to understand this, uh, this family of space times. And of course, it's expected to be, I don't mean to say that, to be unique and stable. So uniqueness is usually understood in a different way, uh, in the sense of uh, stationary space time. But this is another notion of uniqueness of Kerr, which uh, may have uh, so <coughs> some use. And uh, so linear test fields this is, this is a toy problem for this uh, stability of Kerr, right? So We'd like to show that that uh, initial data, which is close to Kerr initial data, eventually settles down asymptotically in some sense to uh, to Kerr. And this is a fairly difficult problem. So, but for these test fields, what we'd like to prove is uh, is boundedness and dispersion. So it's natural to, to look at fields of, of different spins. So the spin zero case is the wave equation. And for that, um, it's known that for, for all, uh, all values of A less than M, uh, uh, we have boundedness. This is due to uh, Michalis and collaborators. And, uh, but for higher spin fields, not so, not so much is known. And uh, there's, there's uh, the work that Peter talked about 
uh, for uh, Maxwell on Kerr, uh, which uses, uh, uses uh, kind of a, a kludgy method in some sense, which we would like to understand better. And um, the obstacles to proving these things are superradiance. trapping and uh, and also bound states and uh, and this is this is for spin s uh, greater than zero so when the sp the spin if you have spinning fields then you can also have bound states and an example is is maxwell as i'm sure uh, peter talked about. So if you have a, if you have a black hole, uh, that gives you a non-trivial topology. So you have, an, you have a, a non-trivial two-sphere in the exterior of the black hole, which can carry a charge. The charge is conserved, and therefore uh, you have a bound state, which cannot uh, radiate off. So that means that whatever you try to do, uh, uh, that to prove uh, uh, dispersion, for example, uh, has to take that effect into account. And so this, this bound state is an obstacle to, to dispersion. And uh, so if we look at, at, at the Maxwell stress energy, so in the spinner setting, it can be written like that. So it's simply phi phi bar. This, this has trace zero because the Maxwell field is conformally invariant. Uh, and uh, uh, if you look at Minkowski, Then what you find, you, let's take a vector field A, which is just R dr. Uh, then uh, the symmetrized covariant derivative is going to be uh, just GAB, which is the Minkowski metric now, minus DTA DTB. So that means that uh, if I take, this is conserved if, If, uh, if I have a solution of Maxwell's equation. So that means that if I take this, uh, if I calculate this divergence, what I get is, is TAB GAB minus the TAB TB. And uh, since T is traceless, this goes away. And what you're left with is minus the energy density, roughly speaking. Uh, and so then that means that we can use Gauss formula uh, to relate uh, the energy on the initial and final slices to the time integrated energy in between. And so ignoring boundary conditions and the growth of the vector field and so on and so forth. This, this, this tells you that in stationary regions, uh, the energy density has to go to, has to, go to zero. Uh, as we move forward in time. And this, is the, this expresses the dispersion of the Maxwell field in, in Minkowski. And if you, you try to do the, the same sort of calculation in Schwarzschild, uh, what you end up with is the following. So now, uh, or in, in, a, in a black hole space time. So now we take F to be uh, A to be some F dr, for example, in, in Schwarzschild. And what you end up with is, uh, is I can schematically draw it like this. Um, so this, this if, I, if I look at the density, um, something like uh, that's coming from this, from this bulk term. This is a scalar, right? So I can call that W. And so if I draw this W, the contribution in this W uh, here, uh, you have the following uh, 
situation. So there, there are two contributions. Uh, one which has uh, not changing sign and one uh, which changes sign around uh, the photon sphere which involves the phi one. So this is the middle uh, scalar that, uh, that shows, that gives you this problem with the sign. And uh, that is, of course, related to the fact that uh, this, this, this obstacle to proving uh, a Moravitz estimate, what we'd like to have is, is, a, is a Moravitz density which does not change sign. Uh, and um, uh, the reason for that obstacle is that the bound state looks exactly like this. Uh, so it's, it's phi AB zeta to the minus 2 uh, OAIB. So this is, this is purely, purely spin 1. Uh, purely the middle scalar is turned on. So phi 0 is equals phi 2 equals 0. Phi 1 is, well, proportional to zeta to the minus 2. So uh, this means that, that this, this Coulomb state is the thing that's causing the problem here. And so what, what seems natural from that point of view, and also from the point of view of linearized gravity, where you have, uh, if we project on uh, the, the vial scalars that gives a collection of five scalars, we can take the Bianchi uh, equation, linearize that, and look at the resulting equations for these scalars. And what you observe is that um, uh, similar to, to here, uh, those, uh, those things that should correspond to bound states for Kerr, namely moduli, variations within the moduli family of Kerr uh, result in linearized psi 0 and psi 4. So the extreme scalars uh, at the linearized level are turned off for those. So this means that uh, for Maxwell, it seems uh, appropriate to look at equations for the extreme scalars. And similarly, for, for uh, linearized gravity, which is the spin 2 theory, it seems appropriate to look at, at, uh, at linear scalars, uh, at the extreme scalars. So let's see now. Uh, <coughs> and, uh, and the way this, so this is now, uh, uh, this is a well-known procedure. And uh, so if we look at curl dagger phi equal to zero and apply another curl dagger, roughly speaking, uh, then this implies a wave operator. So I'll just write it like this, box plus curvature on phi equal to zero. This is uh, an easy calculation. Uh, and uh, this, this is a covariant wave system of wave equations. Uh, if I predict on, on the tetrad, what you end up with is, uh, is a, an equation that can be written like this. And this is for i equals 0 and 2. And this is the, the Tukolsky system. And if you do the same for the middle scalar, what you end up with is uh, this equation here. So this is, the, this is called factor ellipser. So that played a role in, in Peter's talk. Uh, and um, this is a, a well-known uh, system that was first derived in 1972. Um, and uh, it has the remarkable fact that if you take zeta zeta bar times this thing, 
and the, here is the spin parameter uh, of the field. This can be written as uh, in a separated form. So that means that you can you can make a, a, a separated ansatz for solutions of that system. And so on. So, so this is all well, very well known and, and has been exploited uh, in the work of, of Mihalis and, and collaborators, um, the, the so-called mode, mode stability for, for, these, um, for these separated modes. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, this operator is not formally self-adjoint. It, it has uh, slowly falling off lower order terms and so on. So it, it seems it's difficult to use. There is no energy, there is no obvious conserved energy. For this middle equation, there is the same problem. Here is the, the ordinary wave equation, equation wa wave operator, but this is a complex uh, scalar potential. So the psi two in Kerr is minus m or r minus i a cosine theta cubed. So, so this is a complex potential, and, and so uh, that, that causes a lot of difficulties. But so what you would like to have is, is from this point of view, a, a conserved energy which does not involve the middle scalar, because that will, that will automatically get rid of uh, this bound state for Maxwell. And <clears throat> so, uh, so I want to explain how that can be done. <clears throat> uh, and then I think uh, Thomas will, will talk uh, more about this in, in his talk. Um, Okay, so, so as I, uh, I think I mentioned uh, that, uh, uh, that if you have a killing spinner, that auto, uh, valence two killing spinner, that automatically means that you have a second order symmetry operator for the Maxwell field. So, um, and, and uh, um, this, this, this fact is, is related to the symmetry operator. So symmetry operator, I mean an operator that takes solutions to solutions. So for example, the, that commuting operator uh, that was found by Carter that I wrote down for the wave equation uh, is a particular case of a symmetry operator. And so for the Maxwell field, whenever you have a killing, uh, a killing two spinner, you have a second order symmetry operator. And so if we take, and so in particular in Kerr we have that. So uh, if we take such a second order symmetry operator, just like that. Um, and uh, so th this, uh, the, the general form of this is something like this. It's, it's a curl on an A and this, this A is a vector that satisfies uh, curl dagger A equal to zero, okay? Uh, and uh, so if I define the following, uh, uh, so, uh, so let's see, so maybe I, I should, uh, okay, let, let me not write that, that in uh, explicitly, but let me say the following. Uh, if we do this, then uh, because of the fact that, uh, so both of these are now Maxwell fields, I can form a one form by taking uh, phi a b chi bar a prime b prime plus complex conjugate, and then uh, contracting with an, a, a, a killing field a prime, which is the divergence of 
uh, this can be taken to be the d by dt vector field. Um, and if we do the following, so define theta AB is minus 2 kappa AC phi BC symmetrized. Eta is minus. So this, this theta here projects out the phi 1. So this has only phi 0, phi 2 in it. Okay? So, so uh, anything that we define from this is going to involve only those. It, it, it's going to forget about the Coulomb state or the bound state. Uh, and uh, so this is a kind of canonical construction. Uh, the, si the symbol for that operator is, is essentially kappa kappa bar. So it's defined purely from the, the, the hidden symmetry of the, of the Kerr space-time. And, uh, and what you find uh, is, is that um, if we define this symmetric tensor, um, which is uh, and then symmetrized. Then uh, we have the following uh, interesting fact that the, this current, which is conserved, uh, is equivalent. So the difference is a boundary term to minus V contracted with, uh, with Xi. And furthermore, this tensor on its own is symmetric and divergence free. So, so, uh, so this tensor somehow is related to the second order symmetry operator, uh, but is actually uh, uh, a s the form of a stress energy tensor because this piece here has dominant energy condition. So, uh, so the, the tensor is kind of positive up to a lower order term because it's one derivative, zero derivative. Um, and it's also uh, not trace-free. Uh, so so this, uh, this has quite different properties. So, so we've applied essentially one more derivative to the Maxwell field. Uh, and what we get is that we have broken the conformal invariance. And, uh, and so morally speaking, the conservation property of this should be related to the Tukolsky system, which is the wave equation for the extreme scalars. But what you find is that this is, uh, so this is, this is conserved, if this is conserved for solutions of Maxwell. So this tensor is conserved if, if uh, the field is Maxwell, uh, but it's, it, it's not, uh, Tukolsky is not, uh, Tukolsky alone does not imply uh, that V is conserved. Okay, so, so this is really a property, even though this is, kind of defined at the level of one derivative plus one derivative. Uh, this is not uh, actually, a cons the conservation property here is not a consequence of uh, the Tukolsky system alone. Okay. So this, this has somewhat uh, similar properties um, as, uh, as the wave uh, stress energy. So this means that you can you can now try to prove you can now try to prove Moravitz for Maxwell, and uh, and so the scheme is the following that that uh, that you look at P A which is V A B A B plus suitable lower order terms. 
and the structure of this, uh, this stress energy allows you to identify those lower order terms it's, uh, that, that play exactly the same role as the lower order terms that are used in the wave uh, Moravitz. Um, and so if you now choose uh, the, the vector field A to be of the form F of R dr, and you choose this coefficient uh, along the same principles that, uh, that, that uh, can be used uh, in, the, in the Schwarzschild case, you end up with uh, this gives, this, this does uh, give a Moravitz in, for Maxwell in Schwarzschild. And uh, so all of this is, this is very much work in progress with, uh, with Thomas and, and Peter. So, uh, but this, this seems to be working out so far. And, and then um, what, what seems nice is that uh, basically the same vector field as for the scalar wave equation you would, that you would choose if after a lot of fiddling around uh, in, in, in Schwarzschild does work um, also here in this setting. And uh, the final thing I want to say is that now we have, since we're in this setting where we actually understand everything about symmetry operators, and that's, uh, that's in one of those, I think in this 1402 paper. Uh, uh, so since we understand everything about symmetry operators, we can now uh, introduce a collection of symmetry operators. So we look at all possible second order symmetry operators. And, and uh, so this is, this is now the second order symmetry operator for Maxwell. We can uh, take this, this is a bilinear expression in the field so I can polarize it and I can define a higher order stress energy. Uh, And then we can, uh, we can apply the same sort of ideas because in Kerr, what you have is that uh, the trapping is complicated in the sense that the location of the trapped uh, null geodesics depends on the conserved quantity. The, so it depends on the energy, angular momentum, and the Carter constant. So this has to be built into uh, the, the Moravitz estimate. And so what you would then uh, attempt to do is uh, the same as as in uh, as what we what Peter and I uh, tried to do in the in the in the uh, for the wave, and this is to take something like this. So we take a general generalized vector field, uh, which now has two additional indices referring to uh, uh, to the symmetry operators, so, and this would be then just a collection of functions of R parametrizing this, the amount of these symmetry operators, and then uh, a, a radio ordinary vector. And this, this is now being, uh, being studied, shall we say, and, but that seems promising, and I think uh, this seems to be uh, somehow, uh, in morally speaking, uh, the right generalization because so far as we can understand at the moment, the Tukolsky system on its own is very difficult to study. But actually, the Tukolsky system is derived from the Maxwell system by taking one more derivative. And so if we actually go back and use the full information from the Maxwell system, uh, we have more conserved quantities than you would have for the Tukolsky system alone. And so I think that's, uh, that's, the, that's, that's what we're working on at the moment. Okay, thanks. <laughs>